Hey, happy Friday. Thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Race to Walk, and it is time for our weekly Bible study. And today we are going over Job chapter 36. And this is where Elihu tells Job uh, what his problem is. So anyway, um, before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words. And on Fridays, I host a live Bible study on Instagram at Race to Walk. And then I publish two videos a week. I publish a replay of that Bible study as well as a video about books. So sometimes the video is just a chat and then sometimes I have a video about books as live. So anyway, make sure that you subscribe and follow along so you can get updates about that. So we are towards the end of our Bible study, the book of Job. We're actually going to be finishing it up in the month of December. So I'm kind of excited about that. And if you have missed any of the previous Bible studies, you can go to my website at racetowalk.org forward slash Bible dash studies. And there is a page there that has all of the lessons for the book of Job and you can catch up and follow along. And there's also a written version of the Bible study there, if that's what you prefer. Also audio, audio version too. The whole thing with Elihu is that I think part of the reason that we get kind of confused about the book of Job is that God has told Satan in the beginning that Job didn't do anything wrong. So Job is, is going into these, all these trials without anything on his part that he uh, caused to happen. Right. And he is defending himself against his friends who said, you must have done something wrong. One of Eliphaz's responses, he says, you know, that God always vindicates the righteous. And Job is looking around. He says, look around you. All this evil is around you. Is God doing anything about this? So we get to a point where we're like, okay, well, well what's the answer? And then in chapters 26 through 31, Job actually presents his case to God. And so when we come to this last part where Elihu shows up on the scene, this is actually the beginning of God's response. Job wants an answer. He's asking God a question and Elihu is coming with this response. It's important to remember that as we, we can go into a situation and we can um, not have done anything wrong in the situation or to for it to happen but sometimes the way we respond isn't right so we can start to do wrong in a situation where maybe we didn't go into it having done wrong and i think that may be a little bit of what we're seeing in job and we will talk about that and i think that elihu coming when he does is a warning to job a warning that he takes about not getting off track while we're in the middle of trials. When Elihu first responds, he re addresses Job's friends to begin with. And then after that, he responds to Job, or he addresses him. And in the last part of Elihu's speech, which is chapters 36 and 37, he is talking about the goodness of God. So we are just going to go over chapter 36 today. I was going to go over both chapters, but it ended up this lesson ended up being a little bit longer than I expected. So we're going to just go over chapter 36 today. I want to make a, like go over a little bit of a highlight of what the friends had said could open a person up to judgment. So Eliaphaz told, said that it could be on the account of personal sin that we experienced judgment. Bildad said it was on the part of family sin. And then Zophar has said, if it's part of our business endeavor, so if something that we are over or accountable to, so like Job had, you know, this huge enterprise, right? And Zophar was convinced that Job had allowed wickedness to go on in his businesses. And Job has said, no, no, I haven't allowed any of this. But in each of these, the friends were a little bit off, you know, because they were, were not seeing the full picture. Through all this, Job has insisted that he hasn't done anything wrong, right? And he calls out to God and says, hey, show me what I've done wrong. If I've done anything, let me know and I will repent. And so then Elihu comes in. So through all this, Job has begun the the book like in chapter three he was in the dark night of the soul and I, I don't really think that we see that he has a really good um understanding of the god that he's been serving as he doesn't have that really close connection but as he has been 
going back and forth in this dialogue with his friends, he, it's like through this, he gets to know who God is. And so he insists that there's a mediator there who is interceding for him as, as for a friend. And he says in Job chapter 19, 25, that I know my redeemer lives and he'll stand upon the earth at last. And then finally, you know, he comes to the point where he's presenting his case to God. So anyway, we're going to start in Elihu's speech to, to Job and listen to what Elihu's saying. So Job is saying, I haven't done anything. Let's think about maybe what Elihu is highlighting here. Okay, so this is in chapter 36, verse 1. And Elihu continued and said, Bear with me a little, and I will show you, for I have yet something to say on God's behalf. I will get my knowledge from afar and ascribe righteousness to my Maker, for truly my words are not false. One who is perfect in knowledge is with you. So Elihu is telling Job that uh, unlike the friends who are coming and, you know, it kind of seems like there are maybe some alternate agendas there that, that he is going to give glory entirely to God. And he doesn't have any hidden agendas when he's speaking to him and that he's not telling him this so that he can seem like the knowledgeable one that he, this is solely on the goodness of God that he understands this and he's giving credit to God for this. So continuing on in verse five, behold, God is mighty and does not despise any. He is mighty in strength of understanding. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives the afflicted the right. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but with kings on the throne, he sets them forever and they are exalted. So Elihu is affirming here that God does give the wicked their due. And if you remember back in chapter 24, Job had faith that God would, you know, bring justice in the end, in the world to come, but he doesn't really have hope for that in this life today. And his response to Eliphaz, Job is pointing out, it's like, you know, the wicked seem to go out without any recourse in this life. And, you know, uh, Elihu, in response, is saying that God is a God of justice. Okay, and then let's continue on in verse 8. And if they are bound in chains and caught in the cords of affliction, then he declares to them their work and their transgressions, that they are behaving arrogantly. He opens their ears to instruction and commands that they return from iniquity. If they listen and serve him, they complete their days in prosperity and their years in pleasantness. But if they do not listen, they perish by the sword and die without knowledge. So in this section, Elihu is affirming that problems and trials can be caused by a person's actions. However, if the person is caught in what he calls their cords of affliction, God in his mercy will bring a person's transgressions to their attention, giving them an opportunity to repent. And if they do repent, that they will complete their days in prosperity. So if the person refuses to respond to that conviction of the Holy Spirit, um, and repent, then they will perish by the sword and die without knowledge. What this is saying is that we are accountable for the light that we're given. And Job was unaware of any wrongdoing that he did on his part, right? And so he asked God to show him if he had done anything to, that he needed to repent of. And so here comes the pivot point here. It's if God shows you then be ready to acknowledge it and be willing to repent. Be willing to. Habakkuk is like this too. So I'm going to go on my watch here and watch and I'm going to be ready to, you know, for whatever God says to me. And so sometimes we have this separateness between us and God because we're not actually willing to repent. We're comfortable with him being far off because we want to stay as we are, right? And God is 
holy. He is righteous. He is just. He cannot be in fellowship and communion with what is not. And instead of animal sacrifice, we have the blood of Jesus that has atoned for our sins. But what does it say? It's First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So if we're doing things wrong and we can persist in that sin, God can't be in fellowship with us, right? And so if we are convicted of a sin or something that we need to repent of and we refuse to repent, like if we deny the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that is the unforgivable sin, is denying the conviction of the Holy Spirit. What Elihu is saying here is that they will perish by the, the sword and without knowledge is the same thing that Jesus says in Matthew 12, where he says, this is verse 31, Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the world to come. So it's not even just about that sin, but when we, this is what I would tell my Sunday school kids, you know, all the time, God is always the same. He's always reaching out to us. He doesn't change, right? He does not change. But when he tells us something, you know, when he convicts our heart of something and we refuse to repent of that, then we're moving away from him. And that our hearing is, you know, dulled a little bit. And, you know, he will keep on convicting us. So he wants to be in relationship with us. He wants us to be in communion with him, but we can choose not to. And so the more you reject that conviction, then the further away you're putting yourself from God, the further it's this, you know, the searing of the conscience, this hardening of heart. And God will allow us to do that if that's what we choose. And so, you know, in this time, there's so many lies and deception out there. Sometimes it can be hard to know what is true, but when God shows you what is true, when you refuse to acknowledge it because what you've believed before is wrong, then what you're doing is you are denying the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus is truth. The Holy Spirit leads us into truth. And if you don't want to be led to that, you are denying the Holy Spirit. And that's a very, very serious thing. So we need to be accountable for the light we've been given because we will be, we will be judged by that. Okay, so let's continue on to in the chapter 36 of Job. This is verse 13. The godless in heart cherish anger. They do not cry for help when he binds them. They die in youth and their life ends among the cult prostitutes. Whatever our problem is, the answer is always to call on God for help. And sometimes, you know, when we get beat up in life, um, we get bitter and resentful and we cherish anger. And this bitterness leads to, you know, a separation from God. Whatever it is, we need to go to God about it. Let's go on in verse 15. He delivers the afflicted by their affliction and opens their ears by adversity. He also allured you out of distress into a broad place where there was no cramping and what was set on your table was full of fatness. So Elihu is pointing out that um, a very important point here. And so it's what we call, what, uh, we call the, the upside of evil when I was in a discussion with Zach Schmall about his book, uh, Disability and the problem of evil. And so sometimes God brings us to the place we need to be through the very affliction that we are calling on him to be delivered from. So think about the story of Joseph. So if Joseph had never been sold into slavery, um, he likely never would have ended up in the land of Egypt. If he hadn't been accused of assaulting Potiphar's wife, he never would have ended up in the prison where Pharaoh's servants were held. If he hadn't been in prison, then he wouldn't have heard and interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh's servants. And if he hadn't interpreted the dream, he would have never been brought to Pharaoh's attention to interpret Pharaoh's dream. And if he hadn't 
have interpreted Pharaoh's dream, they wouldn't have been aware of this civilization destroying panic that was coming, what they could prepare for and guard against. And an entire region would have been wiped out, including, including Joseph's family, you know, the line of Abraham, where the promised Messiah was to come from. You know, it was a long, hard road for Joseph. And he too was a foreshadowing of Christ as the suffering servant. But in the end, because of everything that Joseph went through, many, many were saved. Joseph the afflicted was delivered by his affliction, not in spite of it. Joseph was brought out of this, his distress and brought to a broad place. And so this is who God is. This is what Elihu is saying. So let's continue on in verse 17. But you are full of judgment on the wicked. Judgment and justice seize you. Beware, lest wrath entice you into scoffing, and let not the greatness of the ransom turn you aside. The greatness of the ransom. So this ransom is a suffering. So um, actually, I hadn't really thought about that as I was writing the study. So that's that's another thing to kind of ponder, isn't it? So this greatness of the ransom. So Jesus's ransom was his sacrifice on the cross that came to this great blessing. Joseph's ransom really was this, all this affliction. What Elihu is telling him that this affliction that he's going through is actually kind of a ransom in, for what is coming. Okay, verse 19. Will your cry for help avail to keep you from distress or all the force of your strength? The thing that stood out to me in this section was the the phrase justice and judgment sees you. So that's an interesting statement, isn't it? And I think what we see here is maybe the root of what is keeping Job's deliverance at bay. So Elihu says that Job is full of judgment on the wicked. So Job sees the wicked around him that are seemingly have, have no problems, right? They're not experiencing these trials. And he is trusting God to bring justice in the hereafter, but he doesn't think anything's going to happen uh, in this life. And as far as earthly occurrences, Job has more faith in his own idea of justice rather than God's timeline for it. So because Job doesn't see it, he thinks that justice isn't being uh, given for these wicked people, that they're not experiencing the, the consequences of their actions. So Job doesn't see that there's any benefit to a person who obeys God and follows God in this life. So if that's the case, then really that kind of puts Job as a righteous one, right? Because his goodness would be coming from himself rather than as a response to the goodness of God. And Elihu says that that is not so and points out that Job is sitting in his own self-righteousness. So he's kind of in a way almost thinking that he's, you know, almost not better than God, but that it's like he's not, God's not living up to Job's own standard of righteousness. So there's always this tension between um, waiting on God and taking action and accepting God's grace and abiding in him and walking out that righteousness that he enables in us. And it's so easy to go from acting in the power of the Holy Spirit and responding to God's lead to walking in our own well and what we think of as right is pleasing to God. It's so easy. To go off track. And so we can stay in that space for a little while before we realize that, um, you know, it's self-generated rather than, you know, God inspired. So I think that's where Job was at this point. And he was doing what he thought was right and honoring God. And because he had always had a good life, um, he never really had to question it. So 
Job had stated in an early chapter that he had always cared for um, orphans and widows from their womb. So that tells me that he's always lived a life of prosperity and influence and that it was generational. He was where he was because he had been born into it. Um, his family made him. So Job honored God because it was probably just the way he had been brought up and because that was the natural inclination of his character. But then disaster struck. Job had to really get to know the God that he said that he'd always followed. And by the time we first heard Job in chapter three, he thought his life was over, right? He was continuing to place his trust in God, but the trust wasn't for this life. He thought he was, there was nothing left for him here. Um, his only hope was for, you know, the resurrection in the next, in the next life. That's didn't see anything, anything else that good that could come in this life. What I think was going on with Job is that he was coming to a point where it was almost like he felt like he was doing God a favor of still serving him. Right. And that Job was honoring God in spite of what God had let happen to him. And this is where Elihu is checking Job. So when Elihu says judgment and justice sees you, I think what he's saying is that Job has determined in his mind that judgment should be falling on the wicked and, and it's who seemed to be getting away with it. And Job wants justice right now for them. And so how can it be fair that Job is experiencing all these things when the wicked seem to go unscathed? So we cannot forget like God's mercy. And um, as I mentioned early in the study of Job, personally, I think that what opened the door to the attacks on Job were his children. So, you know, we learned in the first chapter that uh, Job would always go make a sacrifice for them after they had their get togethers in case that they had done any unwitting sin. He essentially acted as high priest for his family. And so he would make that blood atonement, right? Anything that possibly could have happened, he was constantly doing that. And the first loss that Job had was of his livestock, the thing that he would have been making that atonement with. And then everything happened one right after the other. And it happened while the children were still feasting, right? So before Job typically would have gone to make a sacrifice, atoning for them, before that was even over, disaster struck. One calamity, one right after the other. You know, we read in the first chapters that the messengers came one right after the other. And so Job had nothing left to make atonement. So there was this tiny window of opportunity for this calamity to fall. Satan had said, I can't touch him because you always have this hedge of a protection about him. I think that what we can probably say is that there were probably a lot of other times when Job's children transgressed something that opened a door of, of opportunity for disaster to strike. But God had extended that hedge of protection, right? And so that was the grace of God, that covering that protection that we don't really deserve. That was God's grace. That judgment had been delayed in order to give Job time to repent for um, the part of the sins of his children, right? So that was that grace. And so Job wanted immediate justice for the sin that he saw around him. But he himself probably very likely had experienced the benefit of a delay. So Job is asking, why doesn't God punish the wicked more quickly? And the Apostle Peter talks about this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 6, where he writes, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And that's the ESV. God's desire is that we repent, right? And he gives us time to repent. So Job has made a judgment, not only against the wicked, but against God himself. Job has suffered the wicked art, and that isn't the way that things should be. And God apparently isn't doing it right. 
And so at any point in all these chapters, have you seen, have you seen any of the friends or Job pray for mercy for the wicked? Do you see anything like Jesus' words that he spoke on the cross for, where he says, forgive them, Father, for they don't even know what they're doing. Is there anything approaching that? No. So Job has gotten to know the God he serves through trials. However, he still doesn't have the lens or the heart of God for what he sees around him. You know, he doesn't have this heart for the rebels. This anger, this desire for the swift and brutal judgment is what is holding Job in his desolation. And it's as um, Jesus said in Matthew 7, you know, in that very misunderstood passage, which is Matthew 7 verses 1 and 2. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So Jesus isn't saying that we can't say that an action or a thing is wrong. I, we, we have to do that. You know, God has already decreed, like, what is right and what is wrong. We don't have a right to say something otherwise. So what he's saying is, if you condemn someone and decide that you sh they should be punished, you will be held to the same standard of justice that you are demanding that they be held to. Again, it's not about the rightness or wrongness of the action. That's set by God and can't be changed. It's This is about mercy and grace. And they, and we ourselves, are given time and willingness to repent, right? So we're, we should be praying for the mercy and grace of God. So it's about being in agreement with God and alignment with his will, you know, because he's the one that doesn't want any to perish, but to all to come to repentance. And it's about being that mediator that Job himself wished for, right? That he said that I know I have a mediator, one that will intercede for others as one does for a friend. This is what we're supposed to be doing. And as Jesus told his, his followers to pray, this is in Matthew chapter 6 verses 12 through 14 forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us i think that judgment and justice that job is thinking about what his rights are and what he's owed and i think he's kind of coming to a place where he's judging god okay let's go on to verse 20 do not long for the night when peoples vanish in their place Take care, do not turn to iniquity, for this you have chosen rather than affliction. So Elihu is telling Job not to long for death, and that desiring death rather than going through the affliction that he's in and that he's facing right now, um, if he does that, that is he's turning to iniquity in, in that desire. Okay, verse 22, Behold, God is exalted in his power, who is a teacher like him? Who has prescribed for him his way, or who can say you have done wrong? Remember to extol his work of which men have sung. All mankind has looked on it, and man beholds it from afar. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. The number of his years is unsearchable. For he draws up the drops of water, they distill his mist in rain, which the skies pour down and drop on mankind abundantly. Can anyone understand the spreading of the clouds, the thundering of his pavilion? Behold, he scatters his lightning about him and covers the roots of the sea. For by these he judges peoples, he gives food in abundance. He covers his hands with the lightning and commands it to strike the mark. Its crashing declares his presence. The cattle also declare that he rises. So Elihu transitions now into highlighting the greatness of God. And uh, he describes the wonders and the majesty of creation, which are just, you know, just a slight reflection of the greatness and the majesty of God himself. And he says that there's no one like God. And who can tell God the way things should be done or what he's done wrong? So Elihu finishes his speech in the next chapter, uh, chapter 37, which we're not going to do today. We'll cover that next week. I think now is a good time to just take a pause and to consider if there's any situations where, like Job, that you've made a judgment against God and 
thinking that he hasn't taken care of the situation the way that he should. And so maybe just reflect on that and, um, you know, give that over to God and confess that as wrong. We acknowledge that God and it's not us that knows what that perfect plan is. So we're going to end with that right now. And again, you can go and uh, look at the rest of the lessons and go through them if you like. If you go to my website, erase to mark.org forward slash Bible dash studies. Um, if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you'd like to support this ministry, you can go to erase to mark.org forward slash give. But let's just end this time with a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much that you are so good to us, that you are always extending grace to us, that you want us to repent, turn from these wrong thoughts and actions that we have, and to be in relationship with you. We thank you, Lord, for the grace that you're always extending to us, and help us to give us a heart for others so that we can pray and intercede for them, that they experience that grace as well. Give us your heart for the people around us. Give us eyes that can see them as you see them. And we thank you, Lord, that you are blessing us, that you are always working out your will and your goodness for our life. And I pray for the favor and blessing of God over each person that listens. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for joining me, and I will see you next time.